Welcome to this edition of Theological Journal Part 3 for October 6th, 2020. Let us pray. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, and shine upon our path and souls that we may return our to you with gratitude and joy and peace and quietness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We turn to this classic book of Dr. William Whitaker, Disputation of Holy Scripture, in which he takes on Cardinal Bellarmine. We pick up here. The Trollin Council of Constantinople, which was universal, be it so. But if this decree of the number of canonical books, he's talking about the canon, be ultimately approved, then also concerning the title of high priest was confirmed by the same sanction, which yet they will by no means concede. How then will they divide these things? I acknowledge indeed that this Trollin Synod was ecumenical, but the papists themselves doubt what should be determined of the canons which are attributed to this council. Pegius, in a treatise which he wrote upon this subject, calls the acts of this council spurious and by no means genuine, which he seeks to prove by some arguments. Melchior Canis, too, declares that the canons of that council have no ecclesiastical authority, which is also the opinion of others. For there are some things in those canons which the papists can by no means approve, namely that the bishop of Constantinople is equaled with the Roman, that priests and deacons are not to be separated from their wives, that the law of fasting is imposed in the Roman church and others of the same kind. There is one rule also which truth itself disproves, that which forbids the eating of blood and things strangled. It is besides a strong objection to the credit and authority of these canons that 85 canons of the apostles are approved and received in them. For Pope Galasius declares that the book of the apostolic canons apocryphal, and Gratian says that there are only 50 canons of the apostles and they apocryphal upon the authority of Isidore who hath related that they were composed by heretics under the name of apostles but this synod receives and confirms 85 canons of the apostles whereas Pope Zephyrinus who was 500 years older than the synod recognizes as appears in Gratian no more than 60 Pope Leo IX, who was 350 years later than the Synod, receives the same number exactly, as Gratian writes in the place just cited. The thing itself indeed shows that the canons ascribed to the apostles are spurious. For in the last canon, the Gospel of John is enumerated among the scriptures of the New Testament, which all have agreed to have been written when all or most of the apostles were dead. Yet they affirm that these two canons were not collected by others, but pub published by the assembled apostles themselves. Thus Paresius determines in the third book of his book concerning traditions and others. For canon 28, Peter himself says, let him be removed from communion as Simon Magus was by me, Peter. If this canon therefore be true that Peter was present at the framing of it, but how could Peter, who was put to death in the time of Nero, have seen the Gospel of John, which was written and published in the time of Domitian? For the figment which some pretend that Peter and the rest foresaw the Gospel which John afterward to write is merely ridiculous. So in the last chapter of all the apostles are made to speak, and the phrase occurs, the acts of us, the apostles. It is no less easy to refute the answer which others make that Clemens published these apostolic canons. For how could Clemens, 
whom Damascus and Onufrius testify to have died in the time of Vespasian, have seen the Gospel of John, which he wrote after his return from Patmos during the reign of Trajan. For almost all authors say very plainly that the Gospel was written by John after his ex exile. So Dorotheus in the life of John, the prologue to John, Simeon Metaphrastes Isidorus in his book of the parts of the New Testament, Gregory of Tours, Alcuin upon John, and innumerable other writers of great authority. But the matter is clear enough of itself. For these canons, the apostles approve the constitutions of Clement and his two epistles. At the Council of Constantinople, which hath been received, which hath received the canons of the apostles, condemns the constitutions of Clemens, as indeed many others do, concerning which book we shall speak hereafter. Besides these canons of the apostles damage the papal cause, for they set down three books of Maccabees and omit Tobit and Judith and direct young persons to be instructed in the wisdom of Sirach and make no mention of the wisdom of Solomon. If these are true and genuine canons of the apostle, apostles, then the papists are refuted in their opinion of the number of the canonical books of the Old New Testaments by the authority of the canons of the apostles. If they be not as it is plain, then the Synod of Constantinople erred when it approved them as apostolical. Yet these men deny that a general council can err in its decrees concerning the faith. Certainly this Trollan Synod approved the canons of the Council of Carthage no otherwise than it approved the canons of the apostles. But it is manifest, and the papists themselves will not deny that the canons of the apostles are not to be approved. Hence we may judge what force and authority is to be allowed to the canons of this con Council of Constantinople, and what sort of persons the papists are to deal with who both deny these canons have any legitimate authority, and yet affirm the sentence of the Council of Carthage by the authority of these very canons. For so Canus proves that the authority of the Council of Carthage in enumerating these books is not to be despised, because it was approved by the Trollan Synod. Yet the same man elsewhere makes light of the authority of these canons and brings many arguments to break it down. Fourthly, Galatius, with his Council of Seventy Bishops, recites but one book of Maccabees and one of Esdras, Thus he rejected the second book of Maccabees, which is apocryphal, and Nehemiah, which is truly canonical. Isidore, too, confesses that there are two and twenty books found in the Hebrew canon, and that their canon is the true one will be proved hereafter. Lastly, before they can impress us with the authority of councils, they should themselves determine whether it is at all in the power of any council to determine what book is to be received as canonical. For this is doubted amongst the papists, as Canis confesses. Let us come now to the minor premise of the proposed syllogism. We allow that the Council of Carthage and Galatius with his 70 bishops and Innocent and Augustine and Isidore call these books canonical. But the question is, in what sense are we to make of these books? Of which we now speak of equal authority with those which are canonical in the strict sense. And the truth of this we will prove from antiquity, from Augustine and from the papists themselves. From first place it has been decreed by the judgment of the whole church or defined in a general council that these books were to be referred to the true and genuine canon of sacred books, then those who lived in the church 
after passing of that sentence in law would by no means have dissented from it or determined otherwise. But they did dissent, and that in great numbers, and amongst them some of those whom the church acknowledges as her own children. Therefore, there was no such judgment of the church publicly received. Secondly, Augustine in that same place plainly indicates that he did not consider those books of equal authority with the rest, where he distinguishes all the books into two classes, some which were received by all the churches and some which were not. And he lays down and prescribes two rules. One, that the books which all the churches should be received should be preferred to those which some do not. The other, that those books which are received by the greater and more noble churches should be preferred to those which are taken into the canon by churches fewer in number and of less authority. It will be best to listen to Augustine himself, whose words are these, from Doctrina Christiana. Now, with respect to the canonical scriptures, let them follow the authority of the greater number of Catholic churches, amongst which those indeed are to be found which merited to possess the chairs of the apostles and to receive epistles from them. He will hold this, therefore, as a rule in dealing with canonical scriptures to prefer those which are received by all Catholic churches to those which receive only some. But with respect to those which are not received by all, he will prefer such as are the more dignified churches received to such as held by fewer churches or churches of less authority. Then follows immediately now the whole canon of scripture in which we say this consideration hath place. Hence then I will draw an easy and ready answer. We, with Jerome and many other fathers, deny these books to be canonical. Augustine, with some others, calls them canonical. Do then these fathers differ so widely in opinion? By no means, for Jerome takes the word canonical in one sense, while Augustine, Innocent, and the fathers of Carthage understand it in another. Jerome calls only those books which the church always held for canonical. The rest he banishes from the canonical and calls them apocryphal. But Augustine calls those canonical which, although they had not the same perfect and certain authority as the rest, were wont to be read in the church for the edification of the people. Augustine therefore takes this name in a larger sense than Jerome, that Augustine was not so minded as to judge the authority of all these books to be equal, is manifest from the circumstance that he admonishes the student of theology to place a certain difference between the several books, to distinguish them into classes and to prefer some to others. If his judgment of them all was the same as the papists contend, such an admonition and direction must appear entirely superfluous. Would Augustine, if he held all the books to have an equal right to canonicity, have made such a distribution of the books? Would he have preferred some to others? Would he have not said that they were all alike to be received? Would he not have said that they were all to be received alike? But now Augustine does prefer some to others and prescribes to all a rule for judging as we've seen. Therefore, Augustine did not think that they were all of the same account, credit, and authority, and consequently is in open opposition to the papists. All this is manifest. It makes to the same purpose that the same Augustine in Civitatis Dei concedes that less reliance should be placed upon whatever is not found in the canon of the Jews. 
whence it may be collected that when Augustine observed that some books were not received by all, or the greatest and the most noble churches, his mark is to be remark is to be understood of those books which are not contained in the Hebrew canon. And such are those which our churches exclude from the sacred canon. Let it be noted, too, that in the Council of Carthage and in the Epistle of Pope Innocent, five books of Solomon are enumerated, whereas it is certain that only three are Solomon's. So, indeed, Augustine himself once thought that the Book of Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus were Solomon's, though he afterwards changed, but without correcting that opinion. Or in the same place of the city of God, he speaks of those books. Learned men have no doubt that they are Solomon's. This was one error in Augustine. Another, and no less, was supposing that the Book of Wisdom was written by Jesus, the son of Sirach, which error he retracts. And he alleges an excuse which is neither unhandsome nor trifling for attributing five books to Solomon, that these books may all be called Solomon's from a certain likeness which they bear. Hence, however, it appears that Augustine was in a great mistake when he thought first that these two books were written by Solomon, and then that they were written by Jesus, the son of Sirach. Indeed, Augustine himself testifies that these books were by no means received in the churches, where he says that these books were especially received as authoritative by the Western Church. For the Oriental Church never allowed to these books of such great authority the mistake of counting wisdom and ecclesiasticus among the books of Solomon, although it is a very gross one, was yet, as we read, entertained and received by many. For Pope Mark Galenus, in an epistle to Solomon, adduces a testimony, and likewise Pope Sixtus II in an epistle to Gratus, which shows sufficiently that these persons must have thought that Solomon was the author of this book. I know indeed that these epistles were not really written by Marcellus or Sixtus, but are falsely attributed to them. Thirdly, the papists themselves understand and interpret Augustine and the rest in the same manner as we do. For so many persons after Augustine and after those councils would never have denied these books to be canonical if they had not perceived the unreasonableness of this interpretation. If then they blame our judgment, let them at least lend some credit to their own companions and masters. I will bring forward no man of light esteem, no mean or obscure doctor, but a distinguished cardinal, the special pillar of the Popish Church, Cardinal Cajetan, who assuredly excelled all our judgment, all our Jesuits in judgment, erudition, and authority. I will recite his words because they are expressed and should always be kept in remembrance. Thus, therefore, writes Cajetan at the end of his commentary on the history of the Old Testament. Here, says he, we close our commentaries on the historical books of the Old Testament. For the rest, that is, Judith, Tobit, and the book of Maccabees are counted by St. Jerome out of the canonical books and are placed amongst the Apocrypha, along with Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, as is plain from the Prologus Galeatus. Or be thou disper disturbed like a raw scholar, if thou shouldest find anywhere, either in the sacred councils or sacred doctors, that these be reckoned as canonical. But the words as well as councils as of doctors are to be reduced to the correction of Jerome. Now, according to his judgment in the epistle to the bishops Chromatius and Heliodorus, these books and any other books in the canon of the Bible are not canonical 
that is not in the nature of a rule for confirming matters of faith. If they may be called canonical, that is, in the nature of a rule for the edification of the faithful, as being received and authorized in the canon of the Bible for that purpose. By the help of this distinction, thou mayest see the way clearly through what Augustine says and what was written in the Provincial Council of Carthage. Thus far, Cajetan, in whose words we should remark two things. <clears throat> First, that all the statements of the councils and doctors are to be subjected to the correction of Jerome. But Jerome always placed these books in the Apocrypha. Secondly, they are called canonical by some councils and fathers and customarily received it in the canon of the Bible because they propose a certain rule of morals. There are therefore two kinds of canonical books, for some contain the rule of morals and of faith, and these are and are called truly and properly canonical. From others, no rule that only matters of morals should be sought. And these, although they are improperly called canonical, are in truth apocryphal, because weak and unfit for the confirmation of faith. We may use, if we please, the same distinction which I perceive some papists themselves have used, as Sixtus Senesis and Stapleton, who call some books proto-canonical and others deutero-canonical. The proto-canonical are those which are counted in the legitimate and genuine canon, for example, of the Hebrews. These Jerome's accurate judgment hath approved. These our churches acknowledge as truly canonical. The deutero-canonical are they which, although they be sometimes called canonical in the sense just now explained, are yet in reality apocryphal because they do not contain the combined rule of faith and morals. The papists are greatly incensed against their partner, Cajetan, on account of this most solid sentence, and some even vituperate him. Canis says that he was deceived by the novelties of Erasmus. Let us leave them to fight with their own men. This is certain that there was never a papist of more learning and authority than Cajetan, whom the Pope sent into Germany to oppose Luther. His testimony should be a weighty one against them. Let them shake it off as best they can, and yet they never can shake it off since it is confirmed by solid reason. Thus we have seen how weak their argument is. They have none better for they have none other. Now, since we have answered them, we will proceed to the confirmation of our own cause. Chapter 5, wherein reasons are alleged against the books of the second kind. I form the argument thus, these books concerning which we contend were not written by the prophets, therefore they are not canonical. The entire syllogism is this, all canonical books of the Old Testament were written by prophets. None of these books was written by any of the, any prophet. Therefore, none of these books is canonical. The parts of the syllogism must be confirmed. The major premise rests on the plain testimonies of Scripture. Peter calls the Scripture of the Old Testament the prophetic word. 2 Peter 1.19, for it is evident from Luke 4 that logos means scripture and prophecy. Paul calls it the scriptures of the prophets, Romans 16.26. Zacharias the priest, as he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, which have been since the world began, Luke 1.70 where he means that God had spoken in the prophetic scriptures. So Abram, Abraham says to the luxurious man, 
They have Moses and the prophets, that is the books of the scripture, Luke 18, 39. And elsewhere, Luke says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27, Romans 1, 2. Here we see that all the scriptures found in the books of Moses and the prophets. The apostle to the Hebrews says, God spake in divers manners by the prophets. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Therefore the prophets were all those by whom God spake to his people. And to this refers also the assertion of the apostle that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Ephesians 2.20. This foundation denotes the doctrine of the scriptures promulgated by the prophets and apostles. Christ says, all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And then follows immediately, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, Luke 24, 44, 45. Paul asks King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets, that is the scriptures, Acts 26, 27. And when he dealt with the Jews at Rome, he tried to convince them out of the law of Moses and the prophets, Acts 28, 23. From these testimonies, we collect that the assertion and the major premise is most true, that the whole scripture of the Old Testament was written and promulgated by the prophets. There are many other similar passages from which it may be concluded that there is no part of the Old Testament which did not proceed from some prophet. But we must remark that the entire canonical scripture is sometimes signified by the name the prophets, sometimes of Moses and the prophets, sometimes of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Augustine, in his discourse with Cresconius, the grammarian, said, not without cause was the canon of the church framed with so salutary a vigilance that certain books of the prophets and apostles should belong to it. And in another place, let them show us their church, not in the rumors of the Africans, but in the injunction of the law, in the predictions of the prophets, in the songs of the Psalms, that is, in all the canonical authorities of the sacred books. And elsewhere, read this in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, said Augustine. We said enough in confirmation of the major premise, and we now proceed to the minor premise. We'll bring Dr. Whitaker to a close, a grand and glorious work by that great Cambridge divine at St. John's in Cambridge, writing in relation to Cardinal Bellarmine. We now turn to the Apology for the Church of England by Bishop Jewell. But before we get to that, we have a lengthy preface, which we're reading. That'll be followed by the life of Jewell. And then finally, ultimately a couple hundred pages later, we'll actually get to Bishop John Jewell's gem, Apology for the Church of England, where he shows that the Church of England, Protestant and Reformed, is holy, Catholic, Apostolic, Biblical, Protestant and Reformed. So we now come to back to the preface in which the editor or whoever wrote this is engaging with a Mr. John Butler, who wrote a book, The Doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church. And so the, per the editor is untangling Mr. Butler's pro-papacy. This claim was unfounded. Both the gospel and tradition declared against it. So we pick up here in the middle. Indeed, this was a marvelous proof of his infallibility. 
Still more strangely, Mr. Butler adds, it produced great evil, and then proceeds to show both from argument and authority that it was productive of extensive benefits to Christendom in general. Is this writing like an historian or a partisan? But we must profess ourselves shocked at his language and contemplate with the utmost regret what we must deem profaneness and absurdity, where he talks of Christ's voluntary obedience to the will of his eternal Father, and also to the will of his virgin mother, as initiated by the monks in a voluntary re renunciation of their own wills. The strangeness of such phraseology and arguments makes Mr. Butler's book at once ridiculous and yet curious to the ears of a Protestant reader. He has a method, too, of expressing himself on some occasions and glancing at the most shocking transactions in a language so fastidious, refined, and puerile as is most unparalleled and yet ludicrous to the extreme. Who would have ever expected to have heard the epithet illaudible applied to the impious bulls of Pius the fifth and sixth Quintus? Illaudible. But if Mr. Butler's mistakes on doctrines are so erroneous, he still is more mistaken in his authorities. <coughs> not appearing to be aware of that mutilation of ancient authors by the Romanists, from whose editions alone he seems to have quoted. There is, however, one assertion made by Mr. Butler which must not pass unnoticed, namely that comp commutations of penance for money are, at this time, practiced in our church. And he asks whether Dr. Glover in his reply to the Bishop of Peterborough has not abundantly shown it. It really is of no consequence what Dr. Glover or any other person can prove upon the subject, since it is most evident to all that in whatever sense such a charge can be made, it cannot bear the most distinct, distant resemblance to the practice of the Church of Rome. Where there is no penance, there can be no commutation of it. But this is only one of the many instances in which Mr. Butler has labored at establishing a conformity between the churches of England and that of Rome, but in vain. While the Church of England appeals to the inspired scriptures alone, and the Church of Rome has superadded, the authority of tradition, there not only must result a sense and interpretation independent on sound criticism and the scriptures themselves, but practices, rites, and ceremonies, which as they depend on that interpretation, are in view of the Protestant Church of England, erroneous and absolutely at variance with the revelation itself and which, like the doctrines of the scribes and Pharisees condemned by Christ, must render the word of God of none effect through their traditions. And whilst this interpretation, which is independent on Scripture, is admitted, let not any member of the Church of Rome talk of conformity. There can be no common ground to go upon between us, these are primary distinctions, and hence, as we find is actually the case, must always result in the differences between what is apostolic and ancient and what is modern and traditional, between what is the word of God and what is the tradition of man, between what constitutes genuine Catholicism and what constitutes that which deserves no better name than an apostate and pseudo-Catholicism. Well, that's tough language you won't hear in our time.
getting down to the basics. Having thus endeavored to show that the construction which Mr. Butler puts upon the principles and tenets of the Romish church is not to be received with implicit confidence, we shall now in conclusion use the words of Bishop Marsh, Marsh quote, consider the two oaths of fidelity which are taken by the Romish clergy. One of them is taken by the beneficed clergy in general. The other is taken by bishops at their consecration and again by archbishops when they receive the pallium. The former is a part of the Trent profession of faith, which it is here unnecessary to repeat as it's before been given for the purpose of exhibiting the Romish creed. Quote, this oath by a decree of the Council of Trent and a bull of Pius IV is required to be taken by all beneficed clergymen in the presence of their bishop or his official. And if they are members of a chapter, they are required to repeat it in the chapter. Now, as the canons and decrees of the Council of Dort are holden in such estimation at the College of Maynooth, that's a Roman Catholic college on the continent, an English one, such estimation that even in points of discipline, they are considered as a manual of the clergy, we might conclude without further information that this oath was taken by the beneficed Romish clergy of Ireland. And I suspect here this Mr. Butler may be an Irish Catholic or a Romanist. But if any doubt remained, that doubt would be removed by the declaration of Dr. Troy, the late titular Archbishop of Dublin, who says that it is taken only on the appointment to a benefice. That is, the oath is taken only where the Council of Trent requires that it shall be taken. <clears throat> we have thus arrived at a fact which it was for this to populate of the highest importance to ascertain namely that those who are in possession of an office take the oath of an office but whosoever swears that he considers the church of rome to be the mistress of all churches must of necessity be hostile to the protestant established church he must consider it his duty to use every effort in regard regaining the mistress what is now in his opinion usurped by the faithless servant. Again, whoever swears that he without doubt receives and professes all other things which have been delivered, deferred, and declared by the sacred councils and general councils undoubtedly swears to that which is inconsistent with the allegiance due to his sovereign of the queen, and that time would be Queen Elizabeth. It is useless to, to, to declare that when he swears obedience to the Pope, he means obedience only in the spirituals, for among the things which have been delivered, defined, and declared by the sacred canons and general councils, there are many which as much affect the state of England as they do the established church. The canons which relate to discipline, no less than those which regard the doctrines, faith, and morals, will be considered as binding by those they are swore to receive all of them. Suppose, therefore, that the third canon of the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 be called merely a canon of discipline, Still, the whole beneficed clergy in Ireland who belong to the Romish church are bound by their oath to obey it. And by this oath of fidelity to the Pope, the right to ex excommunicate and depose princes, which the Pope often did, who refused to ex assist in the extirpation of heresy is acknowledged. 
we therefore defy all the casuists of the Church of Rome to reconcile this oath of fidelity to the Pope with the oath of allegiance to the king. The oath, says Bishop March, Marsh taken by bishops at their consecration, which is a very long one, is contained in the Pontificala Romanum Clementio 8. Another edition of this pontifical was published in Paris in 1664 by the title Pontificale Romanum Clementis 8. Primum, Nunc Dano Urbani 8, Autoritate Recognatum. I have examined the Episcopal Oath in both editions and have discovered no difference. I will therefore copy it as it is contained on page 79 of the former and page 69 of the later edition. There have been several tra English translations of it, but I give it only in Latin because the meaning of several passages has been disputed. And we will forego the lengthy Latin text here as we are able. Really quite long, actually. But basically, we take the oath to the Pope. Words, there's one head of the church on earth. Such is the oath of fidelity to the Pope of Rome, which is taken by the Romish bishops of Ireland, with the exceptions noted. The motive to the principal alteration, which consists in the omission of the words hiereticos, schismaticos, is stated in the following presentation to Pope Pius VI. The Archbishops Metropolitans of the Kingdom of Ireland represented to His Holiness that from the ignorance or malice of some persons, certain expressions prescribed in the Roman ritual to be taken by bishops at their consecration and by arch ready, bishops on receiving the pall have been misrepresented which has added new perplexities to those which they daily experience in a kingdom where the Catholic faith is not the religion of the state. Wherefore, they humbly requested, if it should appear expedient to His Holiness, that he would vouchsafe to apply a remedy by some act of apostolical vigilance. <clears throat> this remedy itself has already been stated. But the reason why the titular Archbishop of Ireland thought a remedy necessary is not unworthy of notice. The perplexities in which they were involved on this occasion were owing, as they themselves declare, to the circumstance that the Catholic faith is not the religion of the state. Does this not imply that if the Catholic faith were the religion of the state, these perplexities would not exist? Must we not thence infer that if the Romish religion had been the established religion of Ireland in 1791, it would not have been deemed necessary to apply for omission of the sentence, hereticos schismaticos et rebellus edum domina nostro, well, succoribus praedictus proposit per sequator et impunavo. Nor would it then have been necessary to apply the mild construction, which has been lately put on the words. The propose per sequar would have a very different meaning if the Romish religion were the established religion of Ireland from that which it has when Romish religion lies under restraint. Nor must we forget that if the obnoxious sentence is now omitted, it may at any time be restored at the discretion of the Romish bishops themselves. It is an original part of that oath, and if the Pope was graciously pleased to grant its omission, on account of the perplexities of the Romish bishops in Ireland, 
at those perplexities being once removed, there's nothing to prevent the restoration of the questioned sentence. After, the, you have to submit to Trent is the game plan. After this succinct, the true exposition of some of the prevailing <clears throat> errors of the Church of Rome and of the fallacious grounds upon which Mr. Butler has founded his arguments, we would suggest to our Protestant brethren the absolute necessity of using all lawful means to preserve our country from papal tyranny, our laws, our states, our liberties from papal invasion, our lives from papal persecution, and our souls from papal superstition and idolatry. We would remind them, in the words of Bishop Schmalridge, that, quote, it would have great strength to our cause if we exerted ourselves in the defense of our established church with that hearty zeal, that unwearied industry, and above all, with that firm union among ourselves, which we cannot but observe, approve, and be afraid of in our enemies. All the jarring parties among the Romanists cordially agree in promoting the interests of their church, Franciscans and Dominicans, Jansenists and Jesuits, seculars and regulars lay aside their mutual quarrels and join their forces against the heretic as a common adversary. And though notwithstanding there's so much boasted concord, there is, after all, neither unanimity in opinion nor uniformity in the rites in that church. It must be confessed that there is among them a union of interests which reconciles all the other differences and makes them one entire and well-compacted body. Thus, when the Jews were employed in the rebuilding of the holy city, we read that their adversaries, however divided among themselves, were all united in obstructing that work. It came to pass, said the hate sacred historian, that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being made up and the breaches began to be stopped and built, then they were very angry and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Against this united strength of our enemies, we should be much better able to bear up if we were as firmly combined in the defense of our religion as they were in assaulting it. If our scattered forces were brought to a closer order for the securing that church, which is most rigorously attacked by the papists, as being by them known to be the strongest bulwark against popery. Wise was the observation and wholesome advice which Nehemiah gave to the nobles, rulers, and the rest of the people on this occasion. The work is very great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one from another. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us, and our God will fight for us. May our nobles, our rulers, and the rest of our people be thus united in the defense of those ramparts which the wisdom of our lawgivers hath provided against the assaults of popery. May the great and large work be carried on by joint assistance and by well-concerted measures May those who at present are separated too far from one another draw nearer together for their common defense. May everyone in his place and station diligently labor in this necessary work. May God fight for us and under God. May prudence be unto us a weapon of defense against the treacherous designs 
of our most subtle and pernicious enemies. And then, is that the end of our preface? Yes, it is. The next occasion when we get together, we will be talking. Somebody is, I don't know who wrote that preface, but then we've got a life of the right Reverend John Jewell, Lord Bishop of Salisbury. And we look forward to reading that. Does it say who wrote it? It doesn't say offhand. Well, we will shift from that inquiry to a few minutes on the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Anti-A-N-T-E, a 10-volume set on the Fathers before the Council of Constant. Team. We've looked at Ignatius, we've looked a little bit at what Barnabas, the epistle to Diognetus. We now turn to Papias and a note on the fragments of Papias and expositions of the oracles of our Lord. Look forward to that. There's only seven or eight pages, and he allegedly wrote a five book commentary on the Gospels, and he was in and about among, he was a contemporary of, in the post -apostolic, close apostolic period and he wanted to know second, third hand reports and he was an inquirer, he was kind of like a journalist. And for some reason his vol five volumes have disappeared. Unfortunately, Eusebius, a fourth century historian called him, said he had a small mind because Papias was a pre-millenarian. Well, we turn to Justin Martyr, an introductory note. He's known for his apology, the first apology, and he interacts with a Jewish interlocutor. Justice is demanded, a claim of judi judicial investigation. He notes that Christians are unjustly condemned just for their mere name. Christians are charged with atheism. I suspect this is about 150, 160 AD. We want to tighten up our historical retrieval on a more precise date. Christians are, the charge of atheism is refuted by Justin Martyr. Earl, and Earl, each Christian must be tried by his own life. Christians confess their faith in God. He points to the folly of idol worship, how God is to be served, and what kingdom the Christians are looking for. Christians live as if under the eyes of God. Christians serve God rationally and quietly. The demons misrepresent Christian doctrine. They misrepresent what Christ taught. He offers comments on patience and swearing, oaths, Christ taught civil ob obedience, the proof of the immortality of the soul and resurrection, the resurrection is possible, and he draws, talks about heathen analogies to Christian doctrine, analogies to the history of Christ. I think he had some, spent some time in Egypt as well traveling around as sort of a gadfly before his conversion. And an old man, an old Christian man engages him. <laughs> it's the old untutored Christian man that sells Justin Martyr on that God used to illumine and effectually call and sovereignly regenerate Justin. He talks about God's care for men and the sexual continence of Christians. Was Christ not a magician? He speaks of the Hebrew prophets and that Christ spoke in the prophets and was predicted by those prophets. The place of Jesus's birth was foretold as Bethlehem. And he goes on to other fulfilled prophecies. He indicates there's different modes of prophecies, utterances of the Father, utterances of the Son, direct predictions by the Holy Spirit. The incarnation and first advent was predicted. And you can see he's completely different from the 19th, 20th century 
uh, decadent Protestants who just willy-nilly, by faith, say no miracles at, in order that they could make themselves more palatable to the developing early 20th century culture. Sometimes they're called the culture despisers. We would refer our readers to J. Gresham Machen's book, Christianity or Liberalism, still, written in 1925, I think, still packs a punch. The world, the word, the logos in the world before Christ, the desolation of Judea was foretold. That would be Matthew 24, 25. Christ's work and death were foretold. His rejection by the Jews was foretold. His humiliation was predicted. The majesty of Christ was predicted. And that prophecies in the Old Testament were certain, definitive, and powerful. And he gives a summary of the prophecies. You tell he's got his hand in the Old Testament. He then speaks of the origin of heathen mythology. He talks about demons misleading men and cause persecution, the spirit of that wicked one, the Antichrist. Plato's obligation to Moses, interesting. Um, we just were discussing Plato, whether he visited Egypt and had access to the, the library there. Christian baptism how God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. How it speaks of the administration of the sacraments. This often gets a lot of press on the Eucharist that the Christians gather weekly. And he concludes this first apology. And the word apology in that time frame doesn't mean saying I'm sorry. It's apologia, which in the Greek means defense. So it's a defensive move by a defensive letter, and which implies also offense and assertions in that context. Well, we've got an epistle to Adrian on behalf of the Christians, an epistle to Antidonius to the common assembly of Asia, an epistle to Emperor Mark Aurelius to the Senate. So this is probably the late second century in which he testifies that the Christians were the cause of his military victory. Then we turn to his second apology, again with that idea of defense, his letter of defense and offense. Introduces himself and notes that Urbicus condemns Christians to death. Justin, our apologist, accuses Crescens of ignorant prejudice against the Christians, and we hope in time, God willing, God willing, 10 volume set to read through all these documents. We're like archivists and memorialists and historians looking and doing historical and theological retrieval, biblical retrieval across the ages and listening to those that have preceded us. He also says that Christians do not kill themselves, comments on how the angels transgressed. And then he has a chapter on the names of God and the names of Jesus Christ and what they mean and their power. That should be good. Chapter seven, the world was preserved for the sake of Christians and all have been hated in whom the word dwells. Eternal punishment is not just a mere threat. Christ is compared with Socrates and how Christians view death. Christians proved innocent by their contempt of death. Now, there's persecutions and death going on. Bishop of Smyrna Polycarp died, and we dealt with Polycarp a little earlier and his letters. How the word has been in all men, and by word he means logos, the word in John 1, 1 and following. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Distinction and unity. And then he prays that this appeal, this defense, 
will be published far and wide. And then he draws it to a conclusion as we will bring, bring this section to a, draw, a, a conclusion. And we'll pick up with Justin Martyr. He is put to death himself, probably because he's a leader in the movement. And he has a dialogue with Trifo. Trifo is a Jewish interlocutor. So let us close with prayer. As we close this day, eternal light of lights, God of God, true God of true God, Jesus Christ, light of the world, shine upon our hearts and our minds that all our thoughts and doings of this day may be pleasing in thy sight. Open thou our lips and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Here ends part three of Theological Journals. Godspeed. Good to have you here.